first, I mean, 101st episode of the Comics Alliance podcast. This is your jumping on point to the best and longest running podcast about comic book entertainment news topics. I'm Andy Corey, Senior Editor of ComicsAlliance.com. With me, as always, is Comics Alliance Senior Editor Caleb Goldner, also the author of Mermaid Evolution and Task Force Rad Squad with Western Rudy. Joining us today is Comics Alliance Senior Writer Chris Sims, co-writer of such comics as Subatomic Party Girls and Downset Fight. Today we're going to talk about the week in comic book news, beginning with a discussion of the Fantastic Four reboot casting. Following months of rumors, it's been confirmed that Michael B. Jordan, best known for his work on The Wire and Friday Night Lights, is Johnny Storm. As our guest Andrew Wheeler will explain, this is a problem for some people. The creator of the audiobook series Valentine and the Widow, Andrew is a Comics Alliance contributor who has covered this topic extensively in a recent piece entitled The Fantastic Four Reboot, What the FF? I put the question to you, Andrew. What the FF? Yeah, it's a problem for some people because some people are racists. So that's probably the first thing that we should say. Um, Michael B. Jordan is a uh, very talented young actor. Um, he was up for a lot of awards for appearing in Fruitvale Station this year. Uh, has also known to people from The Wire, I believe, and uh, the movie Chronicle, which was by Josh Trank, who was directing Fantastic, Fantastic Four. Um, but he is black, and Johnny Storm has not traditionally been depicted as black. And this change uh, infuriates and, and alarms and frustrates a lot of, shall we say, old-school comic fans who don't think it's appropriate I can probably say racist. Um, yeah, a lot of racists are upset because, uh, hey, black guy, that's not okay for them. Um, many people were upset when Nick Fury was was cast with Samuel Jackson in that role. People were upset uh, about Idris Elba being cast as Heimdall, especially um, sort of pagan extremist um, white supremacists who didn't like the idea of a Norse god being black, which seems like the right people to be peeing off. I don't know if we swear on this podcast or not. Um, I've not listened to the previous 100 episodes. I'm sorry, guys. It was a crazy 100th anniversary <laughs> last week. You really missed out. I know. I feel terrible. Um, so, yeah. So, people are upset about Michael B. Jordan being cast in a role that he's actually extremely appropriate for because he can pull off a sort of swaggering, charismatic rock star persona um, that kind of is his persona in real life, I think, a little bit. Um, and that's exactly who you want for Johnny Storm. You want someone sexy and charismatic and uh, and that people can swoon over. Um, but uh, but people are, are never going to be happy with this sort of casting because it subvert, subverts their expectations and it corrects a sort of long-established bias that exists in comics, which is that they're full of white dudes. Why is that? Um, you, wrote, you wrote a really interesting remark about why this needs to be corrected, you know, and you, you know, it's, it was a bit deeper than just racism is bad. Can you talk about, <laughs> can you talk about why, uh, why this sort of thing needs to happen? We agree though, that racism is bad, right? Uh, yes. We're, we're I think on the record. So. I, th I think so. Caleb. Okay, good. Caleb. <laughs> Caleb yeah. doesn't, doesn't care. About what? Racism. what? Caleb has some very controversial views about <laughs> racism. <laughs> That he does what? not want a voice on this podcast, you guys. Why am I? What's happening? <laughs> I no. I so pro or, think, pro or against for or against racism, Caleb. I am against it. I am okay with with the casting. I you know it's like Chris Evans when he was cast for the role back in two thousand seven. Was that when that movie came out? I was like, it was. I think it was a lot earlier than that, wasn't it? I. No, it was five, maybe. Was, was Fantastic Four that late? Four? I think so. Surely yeah, it wasn't. Surely it wasn't. Well, anyway, <laughs> I, I thought Chris Evans. I was like, oh great, Johnny Storm's going to be like exactly like he is in the comics, which is kind of like this cocky bro type character. And I was like, that's what the whole movie looked like to me. It was a movie about cocky bros, and then there's Ben Grimm, and he's cool, and then the rest of the characters are just like really good-looking movie stars who fight Dr. Doom with lightning. So, you know, like, I wasn't excited for that movie just based on the vibe. And this movie, I don't know what the hell it's going to be like. I mean, the 
it could be anything. So, I mean, like the casting is like the least of my worries at this point. I just want a movie that doesn't make me roll my eyes, you know? But Andrew, how is it that Johnny Storm is black and Susan Storm is not? Well, I think a wizard did it. But it's possible that the Storms were maybe maybe uh, modern people who adopted children or came from separate families and, and blended their families together. Uh, you know, there are actual plausible reasons why this is possible in the modern age. We have the technology. So um, mm. it's, it's, uh, it's not science fiction. It can be done. What do we think about the other cast members? Um, they seem distinctly young compared to our sort of... Uh, the conventional notion of the Fantastic Four, particularly Reed Richards. So I think the actor playing him, Miles Teller, is the youngest of the four. Yeah, that's my understanding. And we, we think of Reed Richards as being a very sort of senior figure in the Marvel Universe. He and Ben should probably be contemporary since they were uh, classmates. But the the reality is he's the guy with the white temples in his hair. You know, he's professorial. He's... Uh, He's older. So a young Reed Richards, they did it in the Ultimate Comics, and that's the basis of this movie. Um, but it's not the archetypal Reed Richards. Can you explain the Ultimate Comics really quickly? I never read Ultimate Fantastic Four. It just seemed a little too intense for me, just from the name. Yeah, it was... I, re I read it when it came out. I haven't read it since, which maybe is revealing. Um, it's, uh, it's a book about sort of 20-something scientists who who gain extraordinary powers through, I think, extra-dimensional portals or something like that. So it's not quite the same conceit as the uh, Kirby Lee FF. And there's um, a whole piece where Dr. Doom explains that he has robots that are run on Bluetooth. Like, people don't know what the hell Bluetooth was. It was yeah. That Ultimate was Fantastic Four has my favorite dumb change to comics, uh, which is that the Dr. Doom of the ultimate universe is not named Victor Von Doom because that's silly, right? That, like, that's a comic mm -hmm. book name. Like you would never want, like there would never be a real guy named Dr. Doom, right? <laughs> so instead he's named Victor Van Dam, which is like dumber. <laughs> it's like actually yeah. dumber. Well, it explains why he could do the splits so well in their first fight. <laughs> he does. He is actually, he fights a cobra in there. Uh, I do think Jean-Claude Van Damme would be an amazing Dr. Doom in this movie. <laughs> Have they cast that yet? He was quite uh, sinister in uh, The Expendables 2 as the villain whose, whose name was, you know, speaking of great names, whose name was Villain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and That's genius. He was fantastic and he stole the show. And uh, I think he'd be fantastic Dr. Doom now that we're talking about it. I say that with <laughs> no irony at all. Can we start like a grassroots campaign? We are the world's <laughs> most beloved comic book site. Can we start like a campaign cast? Jean-Claude Van Damme as Doctor Doom because he is, he's a weird threatening European, right? Yes, and he, he can do the splits at seemingly any moment. So uh, that's, The reason I bring up Jean-Claude Van Damme is I know nothing about anyone else who's in this movie. I've, I've never watched The Wire. I've never seen Friday Night Lights. I have no idea who any of these people are except for um, the, the original news post that went up. I think you mentioned that the guy who's playing Reed is uh, the guy who played Tintin in the Tintin movie? No. The guy who plays Thing. Yeah. That's the guy, oh, the guy who plays the thing. thing. Okay. Well, that's good because uh, I love the Thing and I love that Tintin movie. That Tintin movie is amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, he gets, a, he gets a vote of confidence from me as well. I don't know anybody else either. Um, I mean... Kate Mara is in House of Cards. I know, I did a Google yeah. image search and does she just play like some sex fiend? Because every picture of her is like half naked like i saw that i was just like whoa this is this is an invisible woman what's, um, what's this character she doesn't but i'm just gonna let you keep on thinking that okay <laughs> can i ask a, a quick question sure uh are the people who are upset about johnny storm being black uh also upset about the thing not being played by a jewish guy not that we know of but i think probably there some of them go. are upset, upset about him being english because that even i'm a little weirded out by that like why an english guy playing a, a Lower East Side Jewish Manhattan night seems a little a, odd. Is there a Yancey Street in uh, England? Sorry, is there a, a Yancey Street? Uh, probably. I think most of the streets in Manhattan are named after things that they stole from, like, Yorkshire. So. Hey. <laughs> Easy, buddy. Stands to reason. I'm not going to sit here and listen yeah. to you badmouth the United States of America. <laughs> you know what? Get over it, man. 
we let you go. You're, you're well, a, the devil. other big, I mean, we, before we move on, let's just sum it up really quickly. Um, we don't know if this movie is going to suck or be awesome, but we know we like Michael B. Jordan and we know we dislike racists. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> I am value neutral on Michael B. Jordan, but I I will commit to being anti-racist. So the other big story... um, was the Guardians of the Galaxy, which we finally got our you know substantive look at for the very first time since it was announced. It's sort of been a perplexing notion that this was going to be a big Hollywood movie, you know, because I mean even a lot of I would say dedicated comic book fans have never even read a Guardians of the Galaxy comic book, um, including myself. So now that we got to look at it, you know, as someone who's un- unfamiliar with those characters, I'm pretty much on board. And the trailer might be my favorite Marvel Studios movie. <laughs> so who knows something about Guardians of the Galaxy and who wants to talk about, you know, what they got from this? Uh, I have not watched the trailer because what? Guardians of the Galaxy ruined the Royal Rumble. <laughs> so uh, I, don't the, want, the, I don't want you is, to explain that. Okay, Is that what you call the Kree Scroll War? Or? <laughs> The Chris Crow War was ruined automatically. <laughs> Does that mean, Chris, that the wrestling is is um is higher in your sort of nerd hierarchy than comics? <laughs> uh, well, certainly higher than Guardians of the Galaxy. The <laughs> Rumble has a a place in my heart that the Guardians of the Galaxy do not, uh, and I say that as someone who uh, quite likes the Abnett and Lanning run. Which, if we get nothing else out of this, we'll get uh the Abnett and Lanning post-Annihilation run on which the movie uh, is is based uh, back into print this summer. So that's good news for people who like good cosmic space comics. And that is a series that I like an awful lot. Um, I'm very... Uh, comics Alliance readers will no doubt be aware that I'm very fond of obscure uh, Bronze Age Marvel characters. Uh, Star-Lord was probably the most amazing return in the history of comics, he is he is obscure even among obscure characters. There was one attempt to revive him with a one shot in the '90s, uh, and then th- between like the '70s and now, the only thing he came back for was Annihilation, and now he's in a movie. Like, <laughs> like he's just like Chris Pratt is starring as Star Lord in Marvel's big movie of the summer. It sounds like there was quite a vision that really saw this character and saw these this group and said, we can make a fucking movie out of this. Well, I think it was like the comics, I think took a very similar task to uh, next wave where next wave started with Warren Ellis, like going on Twitter and asking people what their favorite obscure characters were like favorite characters that nobody had done anything with in a while. And so you get, you know, Monica Rambeau and boom, boom. And uh, uh, Elsa Bloodstone, yeah, machine man and Elsa Bloodstone. Who's like my favorite, like, genius concept that I don't understand why there aren't four Elsa Bloodstone comics every month. Uh, and the Guardians of the Galaxy uh, return with Annihilation is very similar to that because Annihilation was the like the big event that nobody really cared about because it wasn't taking place on Earth. So it was the big event that had characters that no one was interested in at the time. You had Nova was the star of Annihilation, you know? And nobody cared about Nova at the time. And cut to... 2014 and we've got a a nova series that's kind of a you know a big deal in marvel we've got a guardians of the galaxy movie and a lot of it comes down to you know your keith giffen and your uh gabriel delato covers and your dan abnett and andy lanning really rehabbing those characters uh, rocket raccoon is the same way like groot is the same way nobody like listen nobody cares about those pre-fantastic four monsters like the Kirby monsters, nobody cares about Gugam, son of Goom, except for like me and Roger Langridge. <laughs> like that's it. So, getting them as part of this uh, this big movie, it's an interesting story. And uh, but yeah, like I I just haven't watched the trailer yet. I'm excited about the movie. I'm sure it's going to be good. The the peculiar thing actually about that the specific lineup for the movie is that did not exist 
until they decided to make a movie. Like those those five together. Star Lord, Drax, Gamora, Groot, and Rocket. So like all of those characters had been in the Guardians of the Galaxy, but just those five together and those five uh all five had not been had not been a a concept. So they had a bigger pool to choose from and that's what they chose, which I think is is interesting because they decided that one woman was enough. Like that was sort of a bit you don't you don't get a nebula in there and moon dragon. Well, Nebula is, is a villain in in the, the movie. Uh, oh, is, so Nebula is in it, okay. So, but Moon Guys, Dragon I, is not there. Thylabel is not there. Wasn't there a woman Nova as well, or Quasar? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah Thylabel. Okay. Um, well, what you saw the the trailer, Andrew? How do you think of what do you think of the tone? What do you think of the apparent direction of this movie? It seems very distinct from previous Marvel films. I think, yeah, I mean, humour has always been a big part of, of Marvel's movies, but this is definitely, I think, pushing it that little bit further. Um, I don't think anyone had high expectations of this movie before the trailer came out, and I think a lot of people are now changing their, their expectations um, quite radically because, yeah, it's a, it's a concept that even comic fans didn't really give a damn about, and um, it's a director that, that people didn't necessarily have much faith in, um, and a, a cast that didn't really have any standouts so the trailer has actually had a it had a huge amount of work to do and i think it did it very well i think suddenly people are excited and i now believe that this movie will make a lot of money whereas before i i wasn't i wasn't sure that it could see i don't know i i'm as big a i'm as big a fan of james gunn as, as i was of uh john favreau before iron man mm-hmm. and i uh, I like James Gunn. I like that uh, Dawn of the Dead remake that he wrote, that Zack Snyder, visionary director, uh, <laughs> directed. The the last Zack Snyder movie I will admit to liking. Uh, yeah, that's not a good omen, though, is it? Like, oh, well, he was involved in that movie, and everyone involved in that went on to great things? No. no. Yeah, but I think, I think James Gunn has certainly done a lot of fun stuff. Um, you know, like, he... Uh, co-created the video game Lollipop Chainsaw with Suda51. I, I was just going to mention that. I was going to be like, yeah, I know Chris liked that. So. Yeah, which that that game is a lot smarter than people give it credit for. That game is a secret feminist manifesto. And, and I'm the only one who saw it. I think what Guardians of the Galaxy, if the trailer is anything to go on, what it demonstrates is really uh, Marvel Studios sort of just exquisite um, talent and taste in picking people to to handle these things. I think the main secret of all the Marvel films is first casting. They all hang on an extremely charismatic performance by the hero, from Robert Downey Jr. to Chris Pratt. They all they all sort of embody this eminently fun and relatable person, even if they're kind of a scoundrel, as the case is with some of them. I think Thor is probably the biggest surprise of the lot because you just, I mean, whatever you think of those movies, it's really fun watching that guy be Thor Mm -hmm. and James Gunn, Shane Black, John Favreau, Kenneth Branagh. um, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, Joss Uh, Whedon, Joss Joss Whedon, Whedon. you know, um, these aren't the sort of people that you would associate with huge superhero movies as, as they had been defined previous to, I'd say Iron Man. And, they work. It's undeniable. Mm-hmm. They're absolutely entertaining. And I think, as you said, Wheeler, they're pushing it further with Guardians of the Galaxy. It's a, and it's, I think that speaks to Gunn's own sensibilities, wouldn't you say, Chris? I think so. Um, I think uh, Guardians of the Galaxy is, is regardless of whether uh, it's a smash hit and people like it, which, it, like, let's be honest here, it's going to be huge. Like, there's no getting around it. Uh, it's still going to be the weird one out. Like it's going to be the the odd one, um, which I think is fine. And I think it's I think that's kind of the magic of of living now when we've got uh, you know a, like two or three Marvel movies cranked out every year. Is we're getting pieces of the Marvel universe that don't necessarily have to be uh, related to the the more standard superhero story that you get with Avengers. Now I I like those stories. Uh, and I like those movies, but I, I like the weird stuff. Um, and I think Guardians of the Galaxy is going to fit that bill really well. Uh, and I think James Gunn, being a guy who's kind of got a knack for 
weirder, stranger stories is really gonna gonna thrive on that. Um, the same goes with Edgar Wright and Ant Man. Uh, yes, yes. I when forgot. that eventually comes out, so uh, they, they're they're risky choices, you know. And I think that's I think that's cool. I think that's interesting that that's happening. I think regardless it's, uh, of you know. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I, my expectation was this would be a, a one-off, and I think that's kind of how they've pitched it, that they will do one Guardians of the Galaxy movie, which maybe is just them managing expectations. But when you look at how already they're merchandising it with the, the Lego sets, it's actually their most sort of toy-friendly movie yet. And if that works for them, I can see this being a franchise in itself. I think they're deflecting a lot by, by acknowledging how big they're going for it. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. you saw that poster. I, have, I haven't seen the, the trailer, but I've definitely seen that poster where the tagline is, you're welcome, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. uh, like, that, like that, I like more than anything else I've seen about the movie. No, I ended up writing a whole article about that stupid poster. <laughs> I, I know, I read it. I was just taken, so taken aback by it. Um, they're really doing a good job. Yeah, and, and that poster, like, that poster is the most comic book cover uh, poster we've seen out of those... Uh, those Marvel movies, because like, guys, those Marvel movie posters are usually pretty bad. They are. Like, let's let's yeah. be real. They're, they're like stacked clip art, you know, and they they move pieces around. And what I like about this movie the most is I wouldn't care if it were a comic. If I saw that trailer and I didn't know anything about Guardians of the Galaxy, I'd just be like, oh, cool. So there's space police. There's this goofy guy with his own spaceship. And there's a bunch of badasses, and one of them's like a stuffed animal, and one of them's a tree, <laughs> and they have guns, and I'm like it's just all these things that that I like, and that I think, frankly, video game fans like, which the gamer audience is going to be huge for this movie. And if there's not a tie-in video game that's like completely badass, other than one on your iPhone, I'm going to be like kind of depressed because there, there won't be. <laughs> yeah, I know it, there won't be like a you know current gen console awesome MMO or something, but. I mean, it, it just looks cool. It's it's like stuff that I think young people just like. It's what? big, it's flashy, and it's funny. And you don't have to worry about a bunch of people with super goofy names speaking in a bunch of goofy languages that sounds sort of weird. I mean, it's not going to be like an episode two, you know? It's it's the Outer Space A Team, which I think is a is a great concept. Like that's that's got two things I like. Well, it's even yeah. funnier than that because I mean from the trailer it seems that they are all sort of terrible at what they do <laughs> in a way and they uh, even even the sort of uh, imperial uh, commander, you know, archetype who's in the, we see in the trailer, he's John C. Riley tells him these guys call themselves the Guardians of the Galaxy and he says it so incredulously and the other guy goes what a bunch of assholes! And Did I think John C. Riley is in this movie. Yeah. Oh, dude, you gotta exciting. watch the trailer. And You're gonna love the trailer. That's what really makes me want to see it. Is that attitude that it's just it's gonna have a lot of fun with this idea and really ride that line between a pure adventure story and an absurd comedy. I feel like everything I've seen and heard about Guardians of the Galaxy makes it sound like the movie I wanted Neville Dean and Taylor's Ghost Rider movie to be. Uh, cause if you saw that movie, like that movie was a huge disappointment for me cause it was very clear that they, you know, they got Neville Dean and Taylor cause they, they did so that, you know, crank and crank Two, which were these crazy over the top cult hits and ghost writers, this crazy over the top cult character, but they didn't want them to go that far with it. You know, it was still, it still had to be a PG 13 superhero movie. Uh, no, I saw it and I, I agree with you. I was deeply yeah. disappointed in it. And I feel like this is going to be way closer to what I want out of a out of a James Gunn superhero movie, you know? All right. Well, it sounds like we're all in agreement that we like the Guardians of the Galaxy as that's on offer at the moment. Um, Chris, you should go to ComicsAlliance.com and see the trailer and then go back to ComicsAlliance.com and read Wheeler's 173, thing, 173 Things that you missed when you watched the trailer. I did read that article. Oh. uh, And that was some A-plus work. Thank you very much.
So let's talk about some actual comic books for a moment. Not too much, you know, obviously. <sighs> we don't want to get carried away. But we are in the midst of the 30th anniversary of one of the biggest indie comics hits of all time, which is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Caleb, this is your, ex- your area of expertise. Why don't you talk to us about why this is such an auspicious occasion and what the uh, powers that be are doing to market? Well, I would say it's the biggest deal because this, there's, you cannot kill the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like, obviously, like when I was growing up, the cartoon started and I was just a few years old. And so that was like the toy line I just followed forever, like all through elementary school. And then, you know, the Power Rangers came along, kind of knocked it off that podium of extreme kid show full of fighting or whatever that concerned mothers would call in about. Um, but it was back in like, I, as a kid, I didn't realize, you know, the turtles would be gone. And I'd be like, well, I guess the turtles are over. That was fun. And then they would be back. And I'd be like, some new incarnation. And it kept happening like that. And it always felt like they would be gone for 10 years, you know. But I, you look at the timeline and they're only ever gone for like two years. You mean Three gone years. as an animated series or a book or, or what? Uh, well, like a prominent animated series or a film or a really big video game. And the comics are always going on. Like the comics have never really stopped. Um, and, you know, most of the time there's two or three different comic series going based on the multimedia aspect of the franchise or just, you know, the core comics part that um, either Eastman or Laird was kind of in charge of or at least had a hand in. So there's always been a comic this whole 30 years, pretty much. Um, Not necessarily one ongoing series, but there's always kind of a comic and it's always got either Eastman or Laird, the two guys who created it, involved. Um, And so, you know, this... Nickelodeon uh, bought the franchise, Laird sold his share of like the property, um, and Eastman's kind of been brought on as uh, kind of like the brand ambassador, you know, um, for everything, including actually drawing and writing for IDW's ongoing series, which was kind of a reboot. Um, so, you know, that's been going on for a few years. The cartoon's in its second season. And then we've got the movie coming out this summer, which I'm not too excited about that. <laughs> but um, this comic, IDW, has really done a good job of doing a new series that's got a bunch of nods to the classic material but builds a new continuity um, and a brand new storyline. It hits a lot of the same like sweet notes that the old series did, but it's introduced new characters into the framework um, it's had major storylines that have clear resolutions and they've incorporated all this talent like Ross Campbell. That dude is doing like, you know, a little bit for Mirage, uh, back in the day, but he was pretty much known to the average like comic book reader who didn't necessarily buy turtles before that is a guy with an amazing tumbler full of awesome turtles art. So Bobby Curno, the, um, editor at IDW in charge of the turtles, he's actively recruiting like the hottest people to do like at least covers or one-offs or one-shots while this series with Kevin Eastman kind of co-writing with Tom Waltz has been going on. Uh, so it's really impressive. Like what they've done, it's not obnoxious. They didn't have to do anything weird to the turtles, you know, like they've tried a couple times and failed with, you know, they're not, uh, <laughs> what's the, what's the name of the rock tour? Um, that Talking about uh, coming out of their shells, coming out of their shells tour. Yeah. It's not, I mean, it's, it's just like honest, earnest, Ninja Turtles stuff. Um, I just I like the idea that you think there is something you can do with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that's weirder than just the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Right. Like, well, where do you draw the line, Caleb? I draw the line at, uh, I guess, intent. You know, I mean, like, is this something that if you love the turtles, you'd think would be a great idea, or is this something that? you just want to sell to people. And, you know, I like action figures, so sometimes I'm okay with, like, <laughs> just the sell to people approach um, as far as merchandise goes. But with the comic, you know, they did some stuff at Image I wasn't totally into. Like, they ripped off Donatello's arm and he became a cyborg. And there were, like, always naked girls around for some reason in hot tubs. And, like, I don't know. There was some weird stuff in the Image days that I wasn't in love with. 
but I kind of like retroactively. Is that because Simon um, Bisley was drawing it? Maybe. I mean, like, the art was great. Don't get me wrong. But it just it felt a little too, like, rated R Turtles, you know? Um, it wasn't, like, the more... Turtle is kind of like a PG concept, but they beat people <laughs> really badly with weapons and well, decapitate I mean, robots. That's the weird thing about the Turtles, is that the original series is kind of... I mean, it's a it's an 80s black and white boom comic, you know? It's, yeah. it's a weird indie book that is kind of serious and violent. And then it became the most popular thing in the world for six-year-olds. Because yeah, I th- like, which I think is down to the like that concept having that inherent appeal to kids. Uh, like I think yeah, it, like and, it is super easy to do Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and make kids like it because kids already like all of those things. Yeah, that was my like. I've interviewed Kevin Eastman a few times now, and like in this interview about the thirtieth um, uh, anniversary special that they're doing, which is an anthology, like. That's kind of what everybody kept saying. Like, the turtles are just like, the concept's awesome, so you can do whatever you want. As long as you care about, like, the family element and the fact that they're ninjas and, you know, that it's sci fi and a drama. Like, there's a few core things, and you can do whatever from there. What was the first Ninja Turtle sort of encounter everybody had? Uh, I don't remember the first time that I, that I watched the show. Like it had to be like on, on, uh, you know, when it aired on Saturday mornings or whatever. But I remember getting those, uh, family home entertainment VHS tapes from like pizza. Yeah. And I just wore the tape out watching that one. Um, and I remember I had a, I had a friend uh, at school that we were friends because he was a rich kid who had all the figures. Uh, well, I had uh, Wingnut, who was the the bat who was dressed like Batman, yeah, the Batman analog. And, and I had uh, I had a Michelangelo with a Hawaiian shirt, and those were, I think, the first two that I got. And those are the only ones I had for a long time. Wheeler was the turtles a concern in England at the time? Sorry, say again. Was it, were the turtles a big deal in England? Uh, we had them, but we didn't call them ninjas. Weren't they uh, heroes? The they hero were heroes. Yeah, oh, they because weren't... you had censorship issues, right? Yeah, they weren't allowed to be called ninjas. I don't know if they edited the, the cartoons to remove any of the violence. They, they probably did. They, they uh, edited Battle of the Planets, uh, G-Force, to, to remove the, the violence. So, uh, yeah, it was Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. And they re-recorded the theme song, and uh, I guess everyone was just nicer to each other and friendlier. But it was a big deal. It was huge. Yeah, it was when I was uh, uh, at school, uh, everyone was, was talking about it all the time. Uh, turtles are universal. I well, they, that, sorry, go ahead. They couldn't show nunchucks, right? Like, that was the big deal? Like, they had yeah, to give I, uh, Michelangelo something else? I, yeah, I can't remember what they like. They, I don't think they redrew it, so maybe they just sort of removed all of those scenes. But nunchucks were well, nunchucks weren't completely forbidden on TV. Like Panthro had nunchucks, and and I remember that was okay. So maybe it was just how they were used. I do remember a controversy in my school where kids were using like makeshift nunchucks on each other, inspired by the cartoon, <laughs> and. Uh, my mother had a word with me about something. I can't remember. <laughs> I know I saw the show first, but my most vivid early memory was reading a reprint of the Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird comics in an oversized first graphic novel format. And in one of those graphic novels was the first time I ever saw Cerebus the Aardvark. Uh, <laughs> because the turtles went into another dimension and we're in some kind of uh, medieval Cerebus setting. And I didn't understand a word of it. There was like a wizard and this aardvark who spoke in the third person and whose name I could not pronounce. And I didn't see him again until he showed up in Spawn. <laughs> but uh, that's the, those early comics really like set my image of the turtles because it, they were, as you say, like dark and violent and... The story I remember was they were all just sort of hanging out and the foot just like descended upon their like apartment and just beat the crap out of them. And then they had to go off in the woods and recuperate. It was very, uh, 
it was very it was very nightfall you know <laughs> what about you caleb i i was all about the cartoon and the toys and what's funny is i look back at the 80s and early 90s cartoon now and i kind of hate it like the animation is super bad uh the mouths barely like match up with the dialogue sometimes you know it's like but the personality was there and i had my mom wouldn't let me have any of the bad guys <laughs> for basically any action figure line. So, but it, I still got like a ton of turtles toys, and there were so many toys in that line that I just had like dozens and dozens of the good guys. So I had like every variation of the turtles for like five years. And uh, but you know, like to my mom's chagrin, you know, I would just be like, okay, well these are the evil turtles, and <laughs> these are the good turtles. And you'd split it up between the ones with the terrible designs that you hated or thought were lame, and then, like, you know, the coolest turtle design. So, like, that didn't really work. Sorry, Mom. But, um, yeah, I just I, I liked that there was so much, like, design in it, I guess. And even at a young age, I guess I didn't really have an understanding of it, but I appreciated how brazen the marketing was, <laughs> how, how brazen all the toy themes were, and it really introduced me to the idea from the Archie series, which was kind of an adaptation and then a spinoff of the cartoon, like a better version of the cartoon later on. Um, I was like, oh, toys and comics are one thing, and they're amazing, and good comics get toys, and good toys get comics. And that was just kind of my thought process, and I guess it stuck with me to this day. I'm, uh, I'm really interested in the fact that the Turtles, until very recently, were creator-owned enterprise all this time and it's hard to think of another one that was quite as successful as that in terms of um, just the scope of, of the success they had you know they had very good comic books they had popular cartoons and merchandise so they all were you know they all remained in control of, it, of their creators until a bit, I guess basically until they decided to retire and then I guess Kevin Eastman came out of retirement uh, uh, no. Yeah, he doesn't. I don't think he owns it, but he's he's kind of like you know Marvel pays Stan Lee to like show up to things. I don't know. There was like a lawsuit there or something weird. But uh, Kevin Eastman now he's just. I don't think he has a controlling stake in what happens with it. But it was. I think it was really important to Nickelodeon and especially IDW. He's definitely like controlling what's going on at IDW at least as a writer and an artist. Um, and then, you know, Nickelodeon, like, has him go to things, you know, and, uh, the people doing the movie have him at things, you know, so that one of the co-creators is a part of the message that this is an authentic Turtles thing, because I think it would really, um, you know, in 50 years, maybe it won't matter, you know, but, uh, as of right now, everybody who likes the Turtles, who's a little kid, has a parent who either liked the turtles or had a sibling who did or a friend who did. So, I mean, it's really important to have the creators like be part of the message. Um, Peter Laird is kind of fun because that dude doesn't hold back his opinion. Like when the script leaked for the first version of the live action film, he was like, yeah, it sucks. I hate it. It's horrible. And I was like, that's amazing. You know, like, and I'm glad he has the freedom to do that since he's no longer involved in the property. Um, but then, you know, Kevin Eastman, who's a very, he's a very nice man. Uh, like every time I interview that guy, I'm just like kind of blown away by how nice and calm and like respectful and chill he is. Uh, so, you know, when people have asked him about the new movie, he's kind of more like, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like they're working hard on it. You know, like he doesn't have anything bad to say. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, he's definitely involved, but uh, I don't think he's in control, you know, as... Well, uh, not anymore. As, but, yeah, not anymore. But for many years, uh, they were, and I think that's very interesting. And I'm wondering, like, are there any other comics like that where the creators have, have sort of maintained a sense of control as it's become this huge thing? Like, I know that's Todd McFarlane's ambition with Spawn, but it seems like he kind of peaked a little bit early. Maybe Hellboy? Walking Dead, obviously, is another one. Yeah, Walking Dead's a good example. I didn't think about that. 
You about to say something, Chris? Yeah, uh, was it Eastman who uh, founded the Zarek Grant? Uh, I think it was Laird. Yeah, was it was Laird. Laird. Okay. I think Eastman bought heavy metal, though. Yeah, Eastman had heavy metal. Oh, yeah. For, for <laughs> he, he bought heavy metal and made the heavy metal movie starring his wife, Julie Strain, at the time. And John Candy. <laughs> was John Candy in the sequel? He was uh, in one of them. I know that. No, the, he was dead by the time... Uh, Heavy Metal 2000 Fact 2 came out. I think he was a voice in the original one. Yeah, he was a voice in the original. Certainly. Um, I'm, I'm looking at IMDb because now <laughs> I'm very curious. Well, yeah, uh, the Zarek Grant, but I, I, I think the Zarek Grant really speaks well of those guys that they, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, it was a grant that they would give to um, independent comic creators just to fund their independent comics. They wouldn't take ownership out of it. He would just give money so that people could uh, make independent comics. And Gene Yang got the Zarek Grant and did, uh, uh, I think it was uh, American Born Chinese was a Zarek Grant project, which is an amazing comic. Um, I have his Boxers and Saints over here to read. Um, but uh, yeah, like it, it's, that's a really, you, know, you, you talk about guys paying it forward. And you hear so many stories in comics about people getting chewed up by the machine uh, and the guys who, you know, not to say this in a negative light, but they sold out and made a billion dollars by creating the thing that was the most popular thing in the world. Uh, they really, you know, they put their money where their mouth was. They they helped people come up. They helped independent creators, which is nice. Yeah, you hear people talk about, like, what happened to Kirby and then you kind of roll your eyes because you've heard like a thousand stories about like whatever they've done that's totally maybe not like Jack Kirby in any way. But then when the Turtles guys talk about it, pretty much everybody they've worked with who's like a major creator. Uh, I, w I went to see Stan Sakai like a number of years ago at Baltimore Comic Con. Somebody asked him about the Turtles guys and he was just like, he had nothing but nice things to say. He said something along the lines of, yeah, that Yosagi Ojimbo action figure they, they made, like, paid to remodel my house or something like that. So that's amazing to me, you know, like. And it certainly, awesome. like, if nothing else, I, I knew who Yosagi Ojimbo was because of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know, because I'd seen that figure. Uh, so yeah, likewise, when I saw. Likewise, I discovered Cerebus and I became a lifelong reader of Cerebus. I bought all those phone books. You know, I read it to the bitter end. I su supported that independent creator because I remembered him for when I was a kid reading those Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics. Right. That kind of exposure on that level to an audience of impressionable youngsters. Like, I'm, I'm glad they used that power for good. Yeah, same. So, all in all, I think we're agreed. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, best comic book ever. I would rank it well above racism in yes. the topics we've discussed. <laughs> it's better yes. than racism. Uh, we're going a little bit over, but I just wanted to give Chris a moment to uh, talk about RoboCop versus Terminator. RoboCop versus Terminator is amazing. Have you guys read it? Yes. No. Nope. Yeah. I have the original uh, limited edition, I think, graffiti trade paperback of it. Yeah, it's one of those things that, you know, they did that they did the limited like paperback, but you could find it for like a dollar each because it came out in 1992. So there's a million copies of it floating around uh, and you see it and you're like, oh, yeah, Robocop versus Terminator. I bet it's as good as Batman versus Predator three and Superman versus Aliens and all that. And then you look at it and go, oh, no, wait, this is a Walt Simonson and Frank Miller comic from 1992, uh, like the, like the height of Frank Miller. Like, between, you know, between uh, uh, your Daredevils and Batmans and your Sin Cities, like that era Frank Miller, and Walt Simonson, who has been good for 40 years. Like, who's been amazing since the, since the 80s, I guess, 30 years. It's also from a period where the crossovers still had this sort of audacious energy. Like, that was enough to make you read it. It was like, what? Robocop versus Terminator? What? Yeah. Superman versus Aliens? You and know? the thing was... I wrote about this on uh, on Comics Alliance. Ninety percent of those crossovers suck. They're terrible because when you see, you know, uh, Superman versus Aliens, 
Like Superman should just beat the aliens. (laughs) Yeah, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a problem. The aliens should show up on Earth, and Superman would stop them in like two seconds and just like fly them to another planet. All right, you guys are being dicks because in that story, by Dan Jurgens and Kevin Nolan, Superman his powers are very depleted. It's plausible. It's a beautifully illustrated comic. Please, just, please move on from Superman vs. Aliens. I just remember the Please ads move Superman on versus... from Superman vs. <laughs> okay, Aliens. We'll later. But yeah, you, because you have to respect both properties, you know, like, and you want to get four issues out of it. Uh, you can't just have, uh, you know, one, one character, let's say the aliens, just beat Superman or, or the other way around. They, they always have to kind of fight to a stalemate. Like, uh, all the Marvel and DC crossovers from that era are, are the same way. Like, there's a Batman-Daredevil crossover where Daredevil fights the Scarecrow, which should be amazing because it's the master of fear versus the man without fear. It sucks. It's terrible. <laughs> Robocop versus Terminator, not only does it have a great creative team, it's a good guy versus a bad guy. So, you know, at the end, if the Terminator loses, like, that's okay. Uh... And it all makes sense. It makes perfect sense. It's the best kind of fan fiction. Because what happens is, this is the setup. Alex Murphy, RoboCop, finds out that the uh, programming they used to link up his human mind with his cyborg body, like th- that they rewired with his directives to kind of control his brain, because he's a sentient person who is part machine, he is the technological leap that leads directly to Skynet gaining sentience. <gasps> like, that is, that's the setup. OCP essentially creates Skynet as a way to, as part of the RoboCop program. Like, it, and that makes perfect sense. So, uh, the, you know, the, the John Connor, the, your, your John Connors of the world, instead of sending, you know, the Terminator back to kill John Connor, they send that they come back to kill RoboCop because if there's no RoboCop, they can't build Skynet. Uh, well, that's how a good guy. Yeah, exactly. So it ends up like it's a time travel story. You see RoboCop in the future. You see the Terminator in the past. The story actually shifts. Like there's panel shifts between like a utopian future where RoboCop wins and a dystopian future where the Terminator wins. Um, I don't want to spoil the, the last thing that happens in it. Uh, cause if, you know, the book's coming out for 25 bucks in, in July, and if you've never read it, it's amazing. Uh, but the big fight at the end of RoboCop versus Terminator is literally one of the most exciting things I've ever seen in comics. Uh, it's just a great series that I, I think a lot of people dismiss cause it's, you know, it's a dollar book movie crossover. Uh, you know, you can find it at quarter bins at every con. But you should get it. It's really good. It's fantastic. And it's also coming out in, in, in a kind of artist edition, right? Yeah, that's that was a surprise because Dark Horse hasn't done any of those. Uh, those are, you know, I, I think it's very clear that the gallery editions are Dark Horse's version of the artist editions. And we've seen artist editions of uh, Simonson stuff. Uh, IDW did one for Thor, which I did not get, which I do want, if anyone wants to slip me 125 bucks. Um, and those things are beautiful. Uh, they're doing Kirby ones for Fourth World, and I'm pretty much gonna have to get them. It's yeah, like I'm, I'm on board with that one too. Yeah, the, didn't they? Do you have a? Did they do a Rocketeer one or not? Yeah, they did a Rocketeer. They, Rocketeer was actually the first one they had to reprint because demand was so high for it. Yeah, and those things are so pretty. Um, if people don't surprised. know, the artist editions are, and the, and the Dark Horse Gallery edition are comic books that are reprinted at the size of the original artwork and scans from the artwork. So you see the borders and you see the notes on, in the margins and other blue line sketches and things like that. It's basically a way of reading the comic book the way the artist uh, read it on his drawing board. Yeah, it's a it's full-size 11 by 17 reprints, which is amazing. Uh, but yeah, I'm surprised it's taken this long for Dark Horse to do it. Because Dark Horse is always big on art books. Like, I've got the Yusagi Ajimbo art book. There's that really nice Hellboy art book that I have. Um, and I, like, if they're going to do one for Robocop versus Terminator, we're going to see a gallery edition for Hellboy, like, like next year. Well, I think IDW is doing the gallery edition for Hellboy. Are they? Yeah. Okay. For Hellboy and Hell. 
Uh, well, I guess that's I guess that's why Dark Horse is finally getting on top of it. Maybe that might have hastened their um, publishing plans because it's, it's pretty much leaving money on the table, isn't it? Yeah, but RoboCop versus Terminator is a, a great comic. It's it's the crossover that's actually as good as you want it to be, uh, and the artwork is Simonson, and it's gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. So yeah, yeah. I would. Like I'm looking forward to getting this book. Yeah, it's it's kind of rare that there's a publishing announcement that inspires this kind of delight in any of us, and I think this was this was that announcement. Yeah, especially when it's a publishing announcement of a a four issue miniseries from 1992 that we already yeah. own. It's, but as, I mean, as you just described very well, it's it's so fun and it's so good and it's sort of unbelievable that it exists at all, and now it's going to exist in the most deluxe format possible. <laughs> It's very weird, as because, as you said, it's a dollar bin, '90s licensed comic crossover. Yeah, your three choices, if you want to own RoboCop versus Terminator, are pay between one and four dollars at a convention, <laughs> uh, buy a twenty-five dollar hardcover, or get a one hundred and twenty-five dollar gallery edition. And I'm going to do at least two of those things. <laughs> <laughs> but before we wrap up, it's interesting to know it is going to be recolored. Um, but if the artwork that they're showing uh in the press release which we did put on comics alliance um it's being recolored in a very similar coloring style uh it's not the like a lot of times they get the uh the neil adams continuity studios stuff to recolor his stuff for dc and it always looks really bad uh superman versus muhammad ali was that way like i really wanted to get that book but the recoloring is just wretched uh the Steve Olive recovering or recoloring on RoboCop versus Terminator, if that original piece of art is any indication, is just going to be uh, basically making it a little crisper, uh, which is is going to look great. I think that's it for our. 101st episode of the Comics Alliance podcast. Um, Whoa, season 10. Yeah, looking forward to another 100. Uh, I just wanted to tell you guys where you can find all our guests today uh, and their comic books because they do other things besides write for Comics Alliance. I don't because I just am not very talented. Caleb Goldner, where can people find Mermaid and Task Force Rad Squad? Uh, you can find Mermaid Evolution at mermaidevolution.com. Um, and you can find Task Force Rad Squad and links to buy it digitally and in print at taskforceradsquad.com. Chris, where can people find your fine comic books? Uh, there's links to everything that I do at about not, about .me slash Chris Sims. That's C-H-R-I-S-S-I-M-S. Uh, if you're looking for my comics, you can check on Comixology. Uh, just type in Chris Sims and they'll all come up. Uh, Downset Fight is available on there, as well as Subatomic Party Girls, which is the ongoing series. Uh, both of those I co-write with Chad Bowers. And you can catch me on Twitter at, uh, at the ISB. Andrew Wheeler. Uh, the easiest way to find my stuff, including my uh, audio adventure serial, uh, is uh, andrewwheeler.co.uk. That's my website site uh you can find me on twitter at wheeler thanks very much everybody we'll see you next week